I am so glad and excited to be able to share with you God's Word on this resurrection morning. I want to talk on the title of what Jesus did on Easter. That's what I want to talk on and focus on attention on this morning. There was a man who went on a vacation to the Holy Land with his wife and his, and his mother-in-law. And while in Israel, his mother-in-law died from a heart attack. So the couple went to the mortuary um, to find out what to do. And the guy there explained to them that there are two options. One was they could ship the body back to their home country, which would cost about two lakh rupees. Or they had the option of burying uh, the mother-in-law in, in Israel for about 10,000 rupees. So the guy thought for a little while and told the guy at the mortuary, he said, um, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my mother-in-law back. The guy at the mortuary was a little bit surprised. He said, are you sure you want to take her back? Because it's a lot of money, you know. You could just bury her for about 10,000 rupees here in, in Israel as well. The guy said, well, I've heard, you know, stories about how a man was buried here 2,000 years ago, and on the third day, he rose up again. I do not want to take such chances with my mother-in-law, he said. So, this morning, I want to take the next few moments and look at what happened on that day after Jesus rose up from the dead? What did the first appearance of Jesus to his disciples look like? What did Jesus say to them? The Bible makes a record that the first appearance uh, to the disciples as a group is in John chapter 20, verses 19 onwards. And that's where I want to focus on. So get your Bibles. Open with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. I'm going to read from verse 19 onwards, and this is what the Bible says. It says, That Sunday evening, the infamous Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. As you read this portion of Scripture, you can't help but notice the similarities that we're facing today in our world. Just like the disciples did 2,000 years ago, we find ourselves, you know, in locked, locked down homes, afraid of what's going to happen. And I think this passage has a lot to say to us today who are going through what we're going through as well. So this is the evening when Jesus, the day when he rose up from the dead, makes the appearance to all of his disciples who are gathered in one place. And there are three things that I want us to, to notice here in this passage of Scripture that relate to all of us this morning. The first one, which is the obvious, the Bible says the doors were locked. The doors were locked. Jesus did not have to knock. He did not even have to open the door. He simply was there among them in their midst. Not just because he was some sort of a, a spiritual being or a ghost. The Bible says in verse 20, he actually showed them his hands and his side. There's another scripture found in the, in the Gospel of Luke where he says, Jesus says to them, touch me and see, for a spirit does not have the flesh and bones as you see that I have. So Jesus was very much physically present in their midst. The truth that needs to resonate with you and me today, and what we can gather from here is, Jesus can go where nobody can go. He can go where no counselor can go. He can go where no doctor can go. He can go where no lover can go. He can reach you and reach me anywhere, anytime. And it does not matter if you are in lockdown or if you are in quarantine. There is no place where you are, and no depths of personhood that Jesus cannot reach into and touch our life as well. See, the, G the resurrection of Jesus from the dead 
enables him to do what no other being in this universe can do. There is no one like Jesus in all of the universe. He is alive. He is the one and only true living God. What he is capable of, you and I cannot even comprehend. The Bible says, to the name of Jesus has been given the most power in all the names of the earth. Listen to what the Bible says, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 onwards. It says, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus... Or at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The resurrected Savior is an almighty God, all-powerful, all-glorious. He is a bondage breaker. He is a way maker. He is a healer. The devil might have shut many doors in your life. You might find yourself staring at a bleak future at this point in time. You don't know how your business is going to survive. You're wondering if you'll ever get a good job. The hope that you and I have this resurrected morning is because Jesus is alive. There is nothing that God cannot do in our life. He's able to penetrate into the depths of our lives. He's able to reach deep down and begin to give us a breakthrough and a change in our situation as well. I love that song, Because He Lives, I Can Face tomorrow. Come on, someone, lift up your hands and say, thank you, Lord, because you are alive and because you are on the throne. I do not need to fear. I do not need to worry. I do not need to be concerned because you hold my future in your hands. You hold my destiny in your hands. And I am a child of God. I am a son and a daughter. And because I am a son and a daughter of God, God will do everything that he has promised for my life. That's the assurance you and I have on this resurrection day. I don't know what kind of negativity has been brought upon into your life as you sit at home. I don't know what kind of discouragement or depression the enemy has brought in. But this morning, I want you to look at that empty tomb 2,000 years ago where Jesus rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin and darkness. The resurrected Savior that we and you and I look up to is uncontainable, incredible in his power, beyond our comprehension. The Bible says he holds the key of David, which means what he opens, no man can shut, and what he shuts, no man can open. There are some doors that God is going to open for your life in the days to come. You're going to be, you're going to be amazed as you stand and look at some of your bleak opportunities and look at some things that you don't know how it's going to work out. The God who holds the key of David is standing before those locked doors, and if he's able to come into that room beyond the locked door and speak to his disciples this very morning. Jesus Christ is standing in your midst, in your living room. He's able to touch your life. He's able to give you a brighter future. He's able to change those circumstances. He's able to heal. He's able to restore. There is nothing that our God cannot do. What a hope that we have. Come on, someone. You got to give God a hand of praise or a hallelujah because we have a resurrected Savior who is for us and not against us. The Bible says, in the midst of their locked room, Jesus enters. The second thing I want us to pay attention to is verse 19. The Bible says, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Now their fear is very understandable. Their leader had been crucified because he was a threat to Caesar and to the Jews. And even though they had been with Jesus, even though they had personally witnessed the miracles and the great wonders that Jesus did, the disciples on that evening were all gathered behind closed doors because they were afraid of what was going to happen to them in the future. They didn't know what their future was going to be. Were they going to be crucified just like Christ would be? They, they didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. 
how they would be persecuted. And that's, you know, sometimes we can look at them and judge them. Oh, look at these guys who have been with Jesus and suddenly they're afraid. Their fear is very understandable because if we were in their shoes, who knows what we would have done in our life. You know, fear is a weapon that the enemy uses to attack and paralyze God's people all the time. Fear about your future. Fear about your family. Fear about your health. Fear about your children. We all struggle with fear in our life, and more so now during this time of crisis that this nation and around the world goes through. Fear has gripped the hearts of so many people. Fear about what is going to happen. How are things going to turn out? But what happened in that locked room on that resurrection day is a reminder to you and me about what Jesus does when his people are paralyzed by fear. Our Savior is the one who comes to us in our time of need and desperation. He does not wait until we have enough faith to overcome fear. He comes to us to help us and to strengthen us so that we can overcome fear in our life. It's important to understand that Jesus did not get annoyed by the disciples' lack of faith and courage. He did not condemn them for not having more boldness. He didn't come and rebuke all of them saying, what are you guys doing hiding in this room? After all, they'd been with him. They'd seen all the amazing things that he had done, and yet they were shut in a room because they were afraid. And in the midst of that fear, Jesus appears and says to them these powerful words. He says to them, peace be with you. Peace be be with you. That was the same Jesus who walked on the water to them on that night when they thought they were going to drown. And he said to them the exact same words in Matthew chapter 14. He said, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Peace be with you. Maybe Satan has bound you into a bondage of fear. You find yourself worrying and in anxiety. As you see the world around you struggling and uncertain, you wonder, what's going to happen to my life? In the midst of all our fear and pain and anxiety, Jesus comes to us and says, peace be with you. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. What an incredible God we have. You know, Isaiah 49, verse 10, the Bible says, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God, and I will help you. That's what God is saying to you today. Fear not. Do not be dismayed. I am your God, and I will help you. God helps his people in their time of need. God helps his people in their times of crisis. He's not a God who abandons. He's not a God who forsakes. He's a God who comes to help, to strengthen With his mighty right hand, right hand arm, he lifts us up. You know, the third thing that we can notice in that passage is verse 19 again, the doors being locked where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. The point here is that he came right into the middle of their meeting. He did not come to the edge. And call out through the wall wall, and, and deal with him as a distant deity. He wasn't playing games with them. He wasn't toying with their faith. He wanted them to see him and to know him. He wanted them to see his very physical presence in their midst. And this is my message for you this morning. Jesus is not someone who is behind the wall. He is not someone who is hiding behind a curtain. Jesus is not on a high mountain that you have to go up and climb up to find him. Jesus is here. Jesus is among us. Jesus is in our midst. Every single person who is hearing my voice can experience the living, breathing, and the saving power of Jesus Christ. You can know him personally. There is no other God like Jesus because he is a personal God. Jesus said when he was on earth, 
I have come to seek and to save that which has been lost. You and I were his creation. We were made in his image and his likeness. But because of our sin, we became separated from God. We were undeserving of his love. We were undeserving of his grace. But yet, Jesus says, he came to seek and to save that which was lost so that he can give us forgiveness and restore to us. Our God is not a distant God. The Bible says he is a very present help in time of need. Call upon the Lord and he will answer you. At any time of the day, any time of the night, you and I have this incredible privilege to be able to call upon the name of Jesus. And the Bible says he always comes to help, to restore, to lift us up. And this is who our God is. Even on that resurrection morning when his disciples who had been with him for three years, who, had, who were covering in fear, even though they'd witnessed the miracles and the mighty works of Jesus, Jesus comes into their very midst and makes himself available to them. And he says, guys, I'm here. You don't have to be afraid. Guys, I'm here. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. I got it all under control. And that same Jesus is speaking to you this morning and he's saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about how things will turn out. I have it all under control. You trust in me. You walk with your hope in me and I will work all things for good in your life because I am a God who's able to turn evil into good. Though the enemy comes in like a flood in your life, I will raise a standard against him. Our God is a mighty savior. He's the one who rescues us from calamity and danger. And this morning, Jesus is standing in your room, in your living room this very moment, and he's speaking to you and he says, do not fear my son. Do not fear my daughter. I am here. I am with you. I will help you go through what you're going through. Not only did Jesus make himself available, not only did Jesus make himself physically present in their midst, he gives them three promises, you know, in the words that he speaks to them. He gives them the promise of peace. And secondly, he gives them the promise of power. And he gives them the promise of purpose. The opposite of peace is conflict. The opposite of power is weakness. The opposite of purpose is aimlessness. And many, many lives are ruined by conflict, by weakness, and aimlessness. Jesus did not come into the world and die so that he would ruin your life. He came to save it. And what we will see is that he saves us by he saves us from ruining our life by becoming our peace, our promise, and our purpose as well. So coming back to that, that scene in that, in that room there in John chapter 20, come back to verse 19. Let's read it again. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. Before Jesus says anything about power or purpose, he wants to establish peace. Because peace is the foundation for power and purpose in our life as well. You know, the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 of the 21 New Testament epistles, you know, he explains it like this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 onwards. He says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He brought the good news of peace to you, Gentiles, who are far away from him, and peace to the Jews who are near as well. And the peace that Jesus offered the disciples was a peace that he accomplished and fulfilled by the death on the cross. That's why in, in verse 20, he says, you know, when he showed them his hands and his sides, he says, I, he, basically, Jesus was saying, I'm the one who died for you guys. Look at my hands. 
Look at my feet. Look at my side. I, I paid the price. I paid the penalty for your sin so that today, because of what I did, I'm offering to you this incredible promise of peace. If you trust in me, you can experience this incredible peace that I'm giving you as well. You know, the peace that Jesus gives is for three areas in our life. I would say the three areas is the first area is the upward peace. You know, when man sinned and when man disobeyed God, man lost his precious, personal, intimate relationship with God. In other words, he lost his peace, his upward peace. He couldn't commune with the God who created him. He could not walk with God. There was hostility between man and God. Because of our sin, God could not approach us. Because of our sin, which was so repulsive to God, it was hostility to God. But when Jesus came down to earth 2,000 years ago and went up on the cross of Calvary, Jesus established peace between man and God once and for all. That's what the Bible says. He established peace between God and man. Jesus is the great peacemaker between God and man. He established peace between us and God so that you and I could walk with God in intimate relationship. The second peace that God, Jesus established was outward peace. The peace that we need to have with one another. To be reconciled to God is also to be reconciled with God's people. No hostility vertically, no hostility horizontally. No racism, no casteism, no, no classism in our life as well. And that's what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew or Greek. There's neither slave or free. There is no male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's what Jesus did. When he died on the cross, he began to bring humanity under one banner, the banner of peace. He began to unite us regardless of our background, regardless of, of our caste, regardless of our skin color, regardless of our language. To Jesus, nothing matters because the peace that he bought unified man as one. He began to bring peace between one another. And the third peace that Jesus gives is the inward peace. I think this is the most important peace as well because so many of us struggle with this, this, this conflict within us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says, the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The precious peace of a clear conscience. Oh, how wonderful that is. Many people labor under defiled and guilty conscience. They're trying to constantly appease their conscience by doing things they think will somehow make it right with their conscience. Maybe you've done some terrible things in your life that you're guilty of, you're ashamed of. You say to yourself, Pastor, I can never forgive myself for what I did. I want to remind you this morning, that's why we have Good Friday. Because on that Friday, Jesus Christ took our guilty conscience. He took our tainted lives and he nailed it on the cross so that you and I, through the blood of Jesus Christ, can be washed as white as snow and have a clear conscience before God. We can stand before God with boldness and courage because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, having peace with yourself doesn't mean you just go back to living life the way you did. Peace doesn't mean, you know, the sin ceases to be painful. It doesn't mean that they cease to be paralyzing. What, what it does is, when you receive the peace of God, the penalty of sin is removed from our life. And that's what Jesus did. The penalty of sin was death, and Jesus took death upon himself so that by taking death upon himself, he would give life to you and me, life and peace. Now, the question is, how do you receive this peace? Not every person who is born into this earth is born with this peace in their heart. None of us have this peace naturally 
we need to receive this peace. And this peace can only be received from Jesus Christ and from what he did. That's what Jesus was doing on that day, Sunday evening. He was offering the disciples his peace. The peace that he had purchased with his precious blood, he was offering it. So any person who comes to the cross and receives what Jesus did on the cross receives the peace of God into their life as well. But if you ignore what Jesus did on the cross, you then ignore the gift and the promise of peace that God gives as well. That's what the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. You know, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, since we have been justified by faith, we have the peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of our faith in Jesus, we have peace with God. Now, not only does he give us the promise of peace, but then he gives us two other incredible promises, the promise of power and the promise of purpose. Come back to, to verse 21 of, of John 20. Jesus says to them, says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That's the purpose. And then when he said this to them, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit, which is the power. Jesus was going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon the disciples to empower them to do the work that he was going to ask them to do. And you'll read about the pouring, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit gets poured out upon the disciples who waited upon him. And in John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus kind of does a prophetic act. The Bible says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus was communicating to the disciples, guys, what I'm about to ask you to do is something that you cannot do in your own strength, in your own power. You need divine enablement. You need a divine assistance to do the mission that I'm asking you to do. So you need the power of the Holy Spirit to function within you because it is a power of the Holy Spirit when you receive it, enables you to live victoriously on a day-to-day -day basis and experience this life that I am promising you to live as well. And not just to experience the supernatural life, but also to do what I'm asking you to do. And this morning, I want to remind you, those of you who are listening to my message, you cannot ignore the encounter with the Holy Spirit if you want to walk this Christian life with Jesus Christ. For every Christian, there needs to be an encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit. That day when Jesus stood in that room, he breathed upon them and he said, guys, I'm going to ask you to wait for this power to be put upon you. I'm going to ask you to wait in Jerusalem. I'm going to ask you to pray. And I'm going to ask you to, to be in prayer because the moment the power of the Holy Spirit is poured out upon you, there's going to be great power that is going to be released in your life to not just live victoriously, but to do the things that I'm asking you to do as well. So this morning, I want to encourage those of you who've never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to ask God for it. God gives the gift of the Holy Spirit to anyone who receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because it is the Holy Spirit who enables you and me to live and to walk Christ-like on this planet. You cannot, in your own power, in your own strength, live a life that is pleasing to God. We fail. And so many of us, we know that because from our own life and experience, we failed and again and again. And I tell you, the key and the secret to a victorious life resurrected life that Jesus promises every Christian is to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was telling the disciples, I want you to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, after he, he breathes on them as a symbolic impartation of the Holy Spirit, he then says, I'm sending you to do what the Father sent me to do, which is to proclaim his gospel to proclaim his word. Jesus gives purpose to those disciples that day. They were huddled in that room. 
that Sunday evening not sure about their future, not sure about how things were going to turn out, not sure how long they were going to live. Jesus walked into their midst beyond the locked doors, made himself physically present, addressed their fears and said to them, peace be with you. And then he says, gives them two things. He says, I'm going to give you power, but I'm also going to give you purpose, guys. I'm going to give you purpose for waking up tomorrow morning. The purpose of declaring the good news of my kingdom. On this resurrection day, one of the greatest messages for the body of Christ is, we need to become ambassadors of the kingdom of God. I think there's no other time in our world and the time that we live in today, there is a need for the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be declared in our world. And the only way that we can receive this power is through the help of the Holy Spirit. And then when you receive the help of the Holy Spirit, then we receive the divine purpose of God. It's God's desire that you and I will become powerful proclaimers of the good news. After Jesus had that encounter with the disciples in that, in that close room where they were huddled around each other for fear of the future, they listened to what Jesus said, and they waited in that upper room in Jerusalem. And just like Jesus promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured upon them. They received what the Bible calls the tongues of fire that descended upon them that gave them divine enablement. And from that day onwards, these petrified, ordinary, uneducated fishermen, tax collectors, and and normal working class people suddenly received a divine enablement to become powerful men and women of God who will go through the corners of the earth declaring the good news of Jesus Christ to the point that people who saw them could not recognize the difference between who they were now and who they were before. And that's what the resurrection power of Jesus can do. It can transform you into a person that people cannot recognize, into a new person in Jesus Christ to do things that are amazing for the kingdom of God as well. This morning, I want to remind you on this Easter Sunday, there is a divine mandate that has been given to the body of Christ that we are to declare this powerful wonderful message to the people around us. My Savior is not dead. He is alive. There is one tomb that is an empty tomb today. That is the tomb of Jesus Christ. He is no longer there because 2,000 years ago, he defeated the power of sin and death so that he can become our Savior and lead us back into the rightful relationship with God again. Today, in the midst of your locked doors, you can receive peace, the peace of Jesus Christ, to know that he is in control, that he will work together all things for good in your life. And you can also receive the power that comes through the Holy Spirit. To anyone who receives Jesus, power, divine enablement, even for your business, to do well in what you do, that's what the Holy Spirit does is he empowers us to live supernatural lives while on earth. And then we receive this divine mandate, this purpose. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you guys. He's telling to all the disciples, I want you to go and preach the gospel. Tell the people about this wonderful good news of a Savior who came looking for them. May the Lord today encourage us and strengthen us to be powerful men and women who will become ambassadors for the kingdom of God. Maybe you've been listening to my word and you've not yet experienced this resurrection life in your life. The Bible says, for anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus and confesses that he is Lord and Savior, to them is given the gift of salvation. Along with the gift of salvation, God also gives the gift of the resurrected life. Jesus said in John 10.10, I have come to give life and life in its abundance. Today, fear does not have to have a hold on you. Anxiety does not need to have a hold on you. Depression does not need to have a hold on you. Sickness does not need to have a hold on you because there is an empty grave. 
Jesus put to death once and for all our fears, our, our curses, our sins, so that you and I can experience this resurrection life in our life on a daily basis. I want to pray with us. If you're here today and you say, yes, I want to experience this resurrection life, I want you to pray this prayer after me today. It's a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of invitation. It's a prayer of surrender. And when you make this prayer, you're inviting this risen Savior to come into your life and to begin a work in your life. Would you pray with me? Would you say these words after me here this morning? If you would like Jesus to become your Lord and Savior, say this with me. Say, Dear Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Today, I open my life. Jesus, I invite you. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. Today, I surrender my life into your hands. Jesus, break the power of sin and curse in my life. From this day forth, I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name. Let me pray with us. Heavenly Father, I pray for those precious friends who pray that prayer along with me for the very first time, inviting you to become their Lord and Savior. I pray that this very moment, that the very life and the lights of God will enter their life. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the incredible work of God that is going to be established in their life. From this day forth, their life will never, ever be the same again. The power of sin is broken. Their power of the past is broken. From this day forth, their future is secure in Jesus Christ. I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for your blessing upon their life, Lord God. I pray for all of us, other, other members of our congregation who are listening in today. I pray that today, that there will be a renewed call to be powerful ambassadors for the kingdom of God. That we will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be loud voices in our generation that declares the truth, the way back to the Heavenly Father. I pray that you will give us opportunities, even in during this season of crisis, to share our eternal hope and our faith with family and friends. And through that, win people for the kingdom of God. Bless your people. Strengthen them. Heal those who are sick among us. Give them your supernatural strength. Protect every single member of our con congregation. Keep them safe under your wings and under your care and protection. Lord, until the day we come back together and together as a body of Christ and gather together in one place, I pray that your peace and your grace will rule among us, Lord God. We love you and we give you the honor and praise in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, amen, 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 amen. May the Lord richly bless you. Have a wonderful day celebrating one of the most unique celebrations that any people group can ever have, which is the resurrected Savior, the one who defeated death. May the Lord be with you in a powerful way today. Amen.